You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for August 11th, 2023. This week, observational studies versus RCTs, another defense of digoxin, CTO, PCI, blood pressure measurement, and a possible revolution in cardiovascular protection. First, I want to say thanks for the ratings and the comments, and I really appreciate the feedback. Keep it coming, even when you disagree with me. So the first topic today is about observational studies and trials, randomized trials. In my first semester at Hobart College, before there was an internet, I took a course called Ways of Knowing. Little did I know how relevant this general ed course would be to the translation of medical evidence many decades later. Now, while we doctors need evidence to separate us from poem readers, the question remains how much can we rely on the published evidence, since so much of it in cardiology at least stems from non-random comparisons, so-called observational studies. Robert Yeh from Beth Israel Hospital in Boston has focused much of his research in the ways of knowing category of medical evidence in cardiology. He wrote an important editorial in circulation that I would like to discuss briefly. The title is, quote, Bringing the Credibility Revolution to Observational Research in Cardiology. Here is one of his early sentences, quote, Fueled by the ubiquity of data, the explosion of medical journals, and the unchecked incentive to publish, cardiovascular observational research has descended more deeply into a credibility crisis. The crux of the problem, Ye argues, is bias. Bias. Specifically, a bias I speak about regularly here on TWIC podcasts, and that is confounding by indication or treatment selection bias. You know, healthier patients get one treatment, and that is why it looks better in the future outcomes. Ye goes on to describe something I see every week. And that is, quote, medical observational studies often pose incompletely specified questions, they address difference in groups with statistical adjustments, and they avoid causal language even though the entire effort has a clear causal intent. Now, everyone in the science endeavor knows the flaws in these studies, but one way of disguising the flaw is the removal of causal language in the paper. Effects between treatments are called associations, and verbs like influence and impact are removed. Now, Bobby A. cites Harvard epidemiologist Miguel Hernan, who has argued that this avoidance of causal language in observational studies is tantamount to deception, and that this deception is not only disingenuous, but it's harmful to science. Now, Hernan writes in the American Journal of Public Health, and I'll cite his paper as well, that, quote, the proscription against the causal word is harmful to science because causal inference is a core task of science, regardless of whether the study is randomized or non-randomized. Hernan argues that scientists need to stop treating causal as a dirty word. Now, he uses in this paper the example of wine drinking and 10-year risk of coronary disease. Say the hazard ratio is 0.8, meaning that one glass wine drinkers per day have a 20% lower risk of coronary artery disease. Of course, Hernan argues that this is confounded because wine drinkers may do other things that reduce CAD risk. The 0.8 risk ratio, he argues, is a biased confounded measure of the causal effect of wine on heart disease. But, but, we knew this before doing the study. Saying this is a confounded effect is not a scientific statement. It is a logical one. It can never be proven wrong. 
is the same as saying you can die in the next five years. So one reaction is to completely ditch causal language on observational studies, but this does not solve the tension between causation and association. It just sweeps it under the rug. This is his argument. The scientific goal of this example, he writes, is to know whether modifying wine intake influences coronary artery disease or the causal effect on wine on heart disease. It is not the association between wine and heart disease that's important. So, indeed, this is the goal of the hundreds of observational studies that I've covered here. Now, of course, it's always better to do an RCT, but many things, like wine drinking over a decade, for instance, is impossible to study in an RCT. Hernan and Bobby Ye go on to argue that eliminating the causal association ambiguity may help improve the quality of observational research, and the first step, of course, is asking better questions. Meaning, don't just look at an association between, say, drinking one glass of wine and coronary artery disease. Rather, think about how you would design the RCT to answer the question. A helpful approach to define a causal effect would have been observed, for instance, in a hypothetical trial in which individuals in this population had been randomly assigned to either drinking one glass of wine or not drinking wine for a period of 10 years. Now, that's not possible, but finding a causal effect in an observational study then becomes similar to emulating a hypothetical trial. Such an approach would force researchers to consider the intervention over a time period, say, wine drinking from age 55. The second step both of these authors argue is, is doing better confounding adjustments. Hernan argues that if the goal is only associational, you don't even need to adjust because confounding is a given. But if causality is the goal, as it should be, because that is all there is in knowing, right, we need to think carefully about what variables can be confounders. Now, this is the hard part that I have. This is where I get a bit confused because it's hard to know all the confounders. Hernan acknowledges what I've often said, that there is no guarantee that a causal model incorporates all the confounders, and hence there is no guarantee that an estimate can be causally interpreted. But his answer to this question is something that I haven't thought of. Yes, he says, there's no guarantee that we can infer causality, but we can only have an informed scientific discussion if we first acknowledge the causal goal of the analysis. I like this idea. Do the analysis, do the best you can, emulate the trial, and let's argue about the results. And Bobby Ye takes it further in his paper. He writes that the bar is really high to emulate a trial, that is, to reduce or eliminate confounding. Uh, he really focuses on some of the techniques that you can use to balance these variables, things like falsification endpoints that are not expected to differ in one way or another to sort out the confounding. There's also these things called sensitivity analyses for the frequency and magnitude of possible confounding factors. There's also instrumental variables, regression discontinuity designs, and difference in different studies. All of these techniques that could help differentiate high versus low quality observational studies, which we should be doing, he argues, along with reducing the number of low quality observational studies. Now, one problem I have with all this, and I really want to throw it out to you listeners uh, about observational studies, is this RCT duplicate paper. This was April 2023 in JAMA. Now, here was the top group of causal inference scientists, and they chose 32 trials to try to emulate using observational databases. And the correlation that they came up with was decent, but far from perfect. So they could emulate some of them, but not all of them. So I go back to the question raised by Dr. David Cohen, an interventional cardiologist, and he says that some observational studies are correct, I just don't know which ones. So that, that kind of thing still stands. And it makes me quite nervous about making treatment decisions based on non-randomized data because, of course, I have the whole hormone replacement therapy and uh, antiarrhythmic drug therapy after MI uh, debacles in my head. But I now think my frame about this is slightly different. Let me know what you think. And as an example of this, let's discuss a new paper on digoxin and AFib. This is right, uh, it follows perfectly. This is by James Brophy 
and it's in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. Now, I want to first say, well, whenever we talk about digoxin and AFib, I think the discrimination faced by digoxin is unfair. In fact, I'm sure of it. Now, a well-done study published last month in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology lends some support to my thesis that digoxin can indeed help patients who have atrial fib. And again, the study fits perfectly well right after the discussion we just had about observational studies. Now, this was a retrospective cohort claims database study of patients who were discharged from the hospital with a diagnosis of AFib. Brophy and uh, a colleague Lynn Nadu attempted to emulate a trial in comparing outcomes between those patients discharged on a beta blocker, digoxin, or both. Their primary outcome that they looked at was in-hospital mortality and repeat cardiovascular hospitalizations. They studied over 14,000 patients, and this was using a Truven Health Analytics market scan database. They also had U.S. commercial and Medicare claims. Most patients were discharged on a beta blocker, about 12,000 of the 14,000. Only 400 patients were discharged on DIG and 1,500 patients on both. They followed patients for one year, and they did a bunch of propensity adjustments for baseline differences because obviously digoxin discharged patients are going to be sicker. They found no significant harm from patients discharged on DIG alone or the combined DIG beta blocker group. So they used patients on a beta blocker group as a control and they found the hazard ratio for the DIG group was 1.24. Conference intervals range from 0.85, 15% lower, to 1.84 or 84% higher. And obviously that's the non-significant uh, finding. For the combined group of beta blocker and DIG, the hazard ratio was 1.09, conference intervals tighter at 0.90 to 1.31. So digoxin was not harmful when used um, in this observational study with proper uh, adjustments. And I know, of course, my comments, I know it's observational, and the authors list the limitations of observational research, but they did use a target trial emulation. They have a time zero, so there's no immortal time bias. They did their best to adjust, knowing full well that sicker patients get digoxin. Of course, the ideal way to study this is, is an RCT form, and it could be done, but neither DIG nor standard beta blockers have a Novo Nordisk or Lilly to promote them and fund the study. But I think there are clues in this topic, and I have a whole lecture defending digoxin. Uh, doctors Paul Dorian and Paul Angeran wrote a nice editorial accompanying this in the Canadian Journal of Canadian Journal of Cardiology, and I'll link to it. Now, some of the main points I would remind listeners about this is that yes, and digoxin has been found to associate with increase in mortality in observational studies, but these are mostly confounded by indication. In other words, sicker patients get the ditch. Now, I have evidence for this statement. It comes, first of all, from a worthy meta-analysis, and this is by ZIFF, Z-I-F-F, ZIFF et al. in the BMJ, and I'll link to that. They meta-analyzed almost every study ever done on DIG. It was a massive meta-analysis, and the key figure in their paper is that the more you adjust for baseline variables, the less the mortality hazard from DIG, and in the RCTs, there are no digoxin mortality hazards. Of course, that leads me to the DIG trial. You all remember that. A major randomized controlled trial, 1997, no difference in mortality. Uh, the primary endpoint, digoxin, this was a HEFREF study. Now, don't forget, go look it up if you don't believe me, but in the DIG trial, a secondary endpoint was heart failure hospitalizations. And digoxin reduced heart failure hospitalizations by a statistically significant 28% as much as some of our favorite drugs now, think SGLT2 inhibitors. And perhaps the strongest evidence for selection bias in digoxin observational studies comes from a brilliant, brilliant analysis of the DIG trial as published in the European Heart Journal in 2019 by Davila et al. You should look this paper up and I'll link to it. It is a really clever paper. So you know the results of the DIG RCT. There was no difference in mortality, and big reductions in heart failure hospitalizations in the DIG arm. Well, 
Davili et al. decided to study the outcomes of patients who, in the screening process of the DIG trial, were taking JIG. So s some were randomized to stay on a digoxin and others to placebo. And so they had an observational uh, study, right? There was those patients on DIG and those not on DIG before the trial. They then counted up what happened to these patients in the trial, regardless of what group they were put in, placebo or DIG. Well, patients on digoxin before the trial had a 22% higher death rate and a 47% higher heart failure hospitalization rate, nearly opposite results of the main trial. And this just about proves that sicker patients in the real world get digoxin, and that is why observational studies have found mortality signals. I right, two final things more to consider about digoxin versus beta blocker in patients with AF. Now, you know that beta blockers are one of the pillars of GDMT in HEFREF. Well, most of the patients in the seminal trials for heart failure were stable outpatients and in sinus rhythm. Now, go look at the famous Lancet meta-analysis by Kocheka et al., and I'll link to that. Kocheka et al. looked at the mortality in the seminal beta blocker heart failure trials and found that the drugs did indeed reduce death in patients in sinus rhythm but not in patients who had HEFREF and AFib. Their conclusion, quote, beta blockers should not be used preferentially over other rate control medications and not regarded as standard therapy to improve prognosis in patients with concomitant heart failure and AFib, a provocative conclusion. Now, the second thing to remember about choosing DIG versus beta blocker is that there is a small RCT called the rate AF RCT. This was in JAMA 2020. This was digoxin versus bisoprolol in patients with permanent AFib. Digoxin performed equally well in controlling symptoms. And at 12 months, 8 of 20 secondary outcomes significantly favored DIG over beta blocker. And adverse effects were actually less with digoxin. So my friends, uh, I'm a fan of digoxin. You ought to be careful. But this whole discrimination against DIG is uh, inappropriate in my mind. All right, next topic is chronic total occlusion PCI, CTO PCI. Now, the issue of chronic total occlusion comes up pretty often, right? Estimates vary between 15 and 50% in patients with multivessel CAD. So a recent meta-analysis in this area purports to show encouraging results, but its limitations preclude making any reliable conclusions. But first, let's do some quick background. Since I'm sort of simple-minded, I'll go to the basics of CTO for a moment. It sounds terrible to have a chronically totally occluded coronary artery, but it's not actually as terrible as one would imagine for a couple of reasons. One is that our body has an amazing ability to grow collateral vessels in that area. Let's say the right coronary mid is occluded. You can have collaterals from the proximal right, from the circ or LAD. Now, collaterals may not provide perfect supply to the inferior wall. Angina may occur at high demand, but it's still relatively decent blood flow. The second reason a CTO may not be that awful is that it often leads to myocardium that has been infarcted and scarred and opening therefore would do little to help a scar because scar is scar. Now, in the days of old, there were only two choices for CTOs, that is, medical therapy or surgery. A surgeon might bypass a CTO if they were in there bypassing other vessels, but surgery alone for a single CTO was uncommon or rare. Now, though, doctors have amazing tools. It has become possible, albeit hard, to open a CTO and recanalize a previously occluded vessel. The question is, why do this? In cardiology, there are basically two reasons to do things, better outcomes and better quality of life. Well, we have already established in oodles of trials, courage, berry 2D, ischemia, that there is little to gain in adding PCI to medical therapy in patients who have stable coronary disease. So it's hard to argue opening a CTO on an outcome basis, which leaves doing it for symptoms. As most patients with CTO have angina, sometimes it's limiting angina because the collaterals I spoke of are inadequate. And doing things to improve symptoms is totally normal and legitimate. I mean, we do AF ablation to improve quality of life. But, but 
If you're going to intervene for symptom control, you have to have proper evidence of efficacy, and the procedure has to be safe enough that harms don't exceed benefits on average. The CTO-PCI is a really complex decision. You have four main components going on here. First is efficacy. Will it improve symptoms? And for this, there is only one way to know. You need, and I mean need, a proper blinded control. Yes, a sham procedure. You cannot study a subjective endpoint in one group who got a procedure and the other group who got only tablets. That's unscientific. The second component in this complex decision is feasibility. Is the lesion even doable? And of course, that's a judgment call. It depends on the skills of the operator. The third and fourth components, right, are harms. Short-term harms approach up to 3%, and some of these complications are severe, such as coronary perforation. But there are also long-term harms, such as bleeding from dual antiplatelet therapy and stent thrombosis. Okay, now to that meta-analysis I spoke of. JAMA network open. Boy, oh boy, this is a problematic paper. The second sentence of the whole thing is misleading. They write this meta-analysis of seven trials, including 2,500 patients, found that successful chronic total occlusion was associated with improved quality of life parameters of patients compared with patients receiving optimal medical therapy or after failed chronic CTO revascularization. No, there were not seven trials. There were only three trials. The other four studies were observational studies. And before I say a word more about this paper, a learning point here is that you should be very cautious in using summary effects from meta-analysis that combine observational studies and RCTs. Now, the other fatal flaw of this study is that they compared outcomes in patients with successful CTO-PCI to failed CTO-PCI or medical therapy. This is ridiculous, right? You gain very little by looking at outcomes after the fact and only include the good outcomes. This, by the way, is one of the fatal flaws of the seminal trials of Watchman versus Warfarin. The co-primary endpoint of PREVAIL, the reason why this passed FDA muster, was stroke and systemic embolism excluding the seven days after the procedure. That's a ridiculous endpoint to make a decision on because which patient ever gets to exclude the time of or immediately after a procedure? Now, why this sort of analysis is allowed in medical science or published, I have no idea. The third flaw in this meta-analysis, as if the first two are not enough, is that looking at subjective symptoms after an unblinded procedure is unscientific. The Orbita trial demonstrated the absolute need for proper controls when doing a single-vessel PCI. And to the proponents of CTO-PCI, I understand the issues. There are probably patients that will benefit. CTOs come in many different varieties. I understand. But given the higher risk, the lack of outcomes data, the onus is on you all to show that doing this high-risk procedure can benefit some type of patient. If I were commissioner of health, there would be reimbursement for this procedure only if the patient was randomized in a trial. This RCT would have a proper sham control, it would measure outcomes and quality of life, and it would follow patients for at least three years. This is a solvable problem, but not with flawed observational studies, not with unblinded trials, and surely not with flawed meta-analyses. Okay. I squeeze the next topic in here because it's super important and it's very brief. Blood pressure measurement. JAMA Internal Medicine, thankfully, acting like the old JAMA Internal Medicine, has published an important study from a group at Johns Hopkins. First author, Junichi Ishigami. Now, you might think the matter of measuring blood pressure is too basic, boring, or we already know this, Mandrola. Well, I think you'd be wrong because medical harm from mistreatment of blood pressure, especially in elderly, is very common. I bet I see one to two cases per week of syncope in the elderly due to hypertensive therapy run amok. The Johns Hopkins group did something simple. They took about 200 patients in the clinic and did four sets of triplicate blood pressure measurements in randomized form. They used an appropriate size blood pressure cuff, too small a cuff, and too large a cuff, and they randomized the order, and they compared to the blood pressure using the right side cuff if you use too large a cuff, it's significantly at lower blood pressure readings. If you use too small a cuff, you get significantly higher blood pressure readings. They concluded that miscuffing, 
resulted in strikingly inaccurate blood pressure measurements. And I know, you'll say, I already know this, maybe, but I think it is important and worth a public service announcement. Please spread the word. Let's work to normalize good blood pressure measurements. I've already sent a PDF of this paper to the powers to be in our place for circulation to all of the caregivers. Also, kudos to the authors and JAMA Internal Medicine for publishing such an important and well done study. All right, final topic, another brief one. Oh boy, we have a potential breakthrough in cardiovascular protection with GLP 1 agonist. There is big news in this category. And I've covered this drug, uh, GLP 1 agonist, often. Let's just review briefly again. GLP 1 is a gut hormone released in response to food intake, and it acts as a satiety signal. It stimulates insulin release, it inhibits glucagon secretion, regulates gastric emptying. GLP-1 has other effects too, like naturesis, uh, blood pressure reduction, and reducing of inflammation. Diabetes trials have found the drug reduces cardiovascular outcomes. This is a big one, and the company has released positive top-line results. Select is a big RCT sponsored by Novo Nordisk to study the effect of semaglutide on cardiovascular outcomes in patients with a BMI greater than 27 and established cardiovascular disease. The emphasis here on established disease, you had to have a prior MI, prior stroke, or symptomatic peripheral artery disease to get randomized. 17,000 patients, semaglutide versus placebo, primary outcome, time to first occurrence of CV death, uh, MI or stroke. The company announced this week that the trial met its primary endpoint and they gave some encouraging details. It was a significant 20% relative risk reduction in all three components of the MACE uh, primary outcome contributed to the reduction. That's good, especially the cardiovascular death being lower. Also, the report showed a level of uh, safety and patient tolerance that's been seen previously. Okay, so my comments. This has to be considered good news. Of course, we need to look at the details. We need to consider the degrees of absolute risk reduction, the adverse effects, the cost, the value. But it does seem like a new chapter on secondary prevention. It also makes us think differently about overweight and obesity. Right now, I am afraid, and I, I want to say this without getting anyone mad at me, it seems that obesity is somewhat normalized, at least in my community, which, medically speaking, seems wrong because obesity and the cardiometabolic issues that go along with it seem like something medical professionals should address, as we do with hypertension or smoking. Now we have an outcome study that shows in patients with established heart disease that a drug which induces substantial weight loss actually improves outcomes. Weight loss, therefore, is a medical therapy. Of course, I don't want to sound too dim. There are also other potential ways in which GLP-1 agonists may reduce CV outcomes, but it, weight loss surely seems the most likely causal factor. Now, another question I will have is whether a motivated patient can achieve the same success with lifestyle intervention. I have seen patients, and surely you have too, patients who have had a small MI or a small stroke and become totally transformed into a beacons of health by losing weight, gaining fitness, improving diet. Does one gain the same outcomes as taking a drug that induces nausea and decreases gastric emptying? I don't know. We'll talk more about it surely at ESC. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time to give us a rating. Write me a review. Write me an email. I love learning things about uh, what you think. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.